I want to just start real quickly um, by clarifying one thing we talked about at the end of our class on Monday uh, before you dig into your uh, group assignment for today. Um, so here's a, an example of a sequence. It doesn't really matter what the formula for it is. Um, and I think that this sequence, just based on what it looks like, uh, we can all agree that we're not really looking at a sequence which is convergent in this example, right? No matter where I place um, the center of my little epsilon neighborhood, uh, I can find a way for my sequence to break out of that neighborhood for some sufficiently small epsilon. Um, so the limit of this sequence does not exist. Um, but last time we also talked about the concept of a limit superior, the limb soup of a sequence. Uh, and at the time, I kind of introduced it by saying, well, we, one of the things we did on Monday was we argued for the existence of a subsequence of this sequence, which was convergent and whose limit was equal to 1. Uh, and one of the ways we can see that um, is that if we take the tops of all of these little peaks, right, that just those terms in the sequence which are at the tops of these peaks, those terms do eventually <coughs> enter into this little epsilon strip centered at 1 and never leave. Right? So uh, there exists a subsequence that converges to that. And what's more, and this is what I said on Monday, um, it was the case on Monday that the sequence we looked at also never crashed through the ceiling of any of these epsilon strips, even though they did crash through the floor, and in fact crash through the floor infinitely often as we go out towards infinity. Um, and so at the time, my claim was that never crashing through the ceiling is what makes it so that if I just drop my floor out and take a look at this as my new uh, sort of epsilon neighborhood, if you like, um, if we just drop the floor out, now my sequence eventually goes into this red shaded area and never leaves because it never crashes through the ceiling, uh, and therefore one was the limb soup, the limit superior of the sequence. Um, but now I've changed the sequence compared to the one we looked at on Monday. So limb soup of Sn is equal to one um, because, the, and the definition was, uh, for all epsilon greater than zero, there exists an n natural numbers such that for all little n's that are greater than or equal to big N, we have that Sn is less than or equal to, sorry, less than 1 plus epsilon. Right? Um, but now I've changed my sequence, and I've changed it in a way that has kind of altered what happens here at the beginning. Right? The sequence we looked at last time just kind of started here and then after that, it looked like the rest of it. But now I've changed the sequence a little bit. So can you tell me, now that my sequence actually does crash out of the ceiling at some point, can we still say that the, limb uh, the limit superior is 1? On one hand, some terms of the sequence do, do in fact exceed that ceiling, right? They do go above 1 plus epsilon for some values of epsilon, right? In particular, for the value of epsilon that I seem to have chosen here, uh, which is 0.22 for whatever that's worth. Um, some terms of my sequence do, in fact, exceed that ceiling, 1 plus epsilon. On the one hand, I was nervous because this condition is not satisfied for all values of n. Right? <coughs> that there are some values of n for which the Sn is less than 1 plus epsilon condition is not satisfied. But what you're saying is that that doesn't change our idea of limit superior because limit superior requires that this just happen past a certain point. right? That there exists some capital N, and after that capital N, we never crash through the ceiling, right? So we can crash through the ceiling as many times as we want to as long as eventually we stop it and we remain underneath the ceiling for the rest of time. Right? So in this example, um, with the epsilon that we've chosen, it looks like by the fifth term, once we get past the fifth term, then we never crash through that ceiling again. Right? And that's okay as far as limit superiors are concerned, right? Just like with limits, what they're most concerned with are asymptotic behaviors, right? Behaviors that don't depend on something that happens even a large finite number of times at the beginning of a sequence, as long as there is an infinite tail of the sequence in which this condition is satisfied. And for this sequence, it does look like that's the case, right? That uh, once this settles down after this first turn, then after that, this condition is satisfied. So as long as I can make my n big enough so that after that n, we never crash through the ceiling. And the ceiling that we set is the lowest possible ceiling that we could set, right? That's the other, um, that's the other requirement to actually be the limb soup. It's the 
it's the smallest such value that we can, it's the smallest value that we can put here, right over here, right? Uh, we can't put any smaller value than one right there. We could put larger values, right? If we raise the ceiling, then we're still going to be staying able to stay under it. But the lowest possible ceiling that we can place that my sequence never, or that my sequence eventually never crashes through, right? that's what we call the limit superior. Yeah, so here's an example of a sequence that's actually convergent. Its limit is zero. Um, we know that it's convergent. We know that it's convergent um, because no matter how small of an epsilon that I place for my little epsilon tube around x equals, around y equals zero, eventually my sequence enters that strip and it never leaves. And so the limit of the sequence actually is zero. Um, so why is the limb soup therefore equal to zero? If we enter this orange tube and never leave it, what else do we also enter and never leave? We also enter and never leave this whole half plane whose upper limit is the same as the upper limit of my tube, right? If I enter the orange strip and I never leave it, that means I also enter this whole blue half plane and never leave it, right? which is the condition for being uh, a limb soup, right? Uh, and zero is also the smallest number for which uh, we always get less than zero plus epsilon and remain inside of that tube. So remember, limb soup and limb inf kind of get half of the story of what a regular one-sided, sorry, double-sided limit actually get, right? The only difference is that for a regular limit, we have to be trapped inside of this tube and epsilons reach away from our limit on both sides. And for limb soup, we just have to be trapped in epsilons limit away on the high side, but we can go down as far as we want to. But the point is that if my original sequence is convergent, so in this example, the limit of my original sequence was zero, as n goes to infinity, then, in particular, it's also true that the limit superior of my sequence is zero. And the theorem that goes along with this is that if Sn is convergent, then the value of the limit agrees with the value of the limit superior. How about the limit inferior? Same, Same deal, exactly. The only difference is that in that case, my half plane goes, it's the upper half plane instead of the lower half plane. Right? So for a convergent sequence, all of these different types of limits tell us the same story. It's only for sequences which don't converge where we can get some interesting behavior. Um, in fact, uh, you might be able to prove, well, I suppose it's a contrapositive of this in some ways, uh, and that is uh, that if I have a sequence, let's call it an, and if the limit inferior of an is not equal to the limit superior of an, then what do we conclude about an? Is not convergent. Yeah, that would be the contrapositive of this. So actually, this gives us one more way to prove that a sequence is not convergent uh, without appealing to the original definition of convergence. If you can show me what the limb soup and the limb inf are, and they're different from one another, um, then there's no way that that original sequence can be convergent. And that's just the contrapositive of this result.